Oder was? Die man in Gott. Wir wollen ja in der Pimp, in der Tree. Er bildet die Tür von Honig geweiht, euch klein wie ein Vogel, klein wie ein Nebel, aus ich wie Arbe euch viel. Nes euch Wort, treu nicht der Esprit klein, und Golivo a Gobeis. And that's the extent. So now to the English. So it's a wonderful verse. It's a great verse, this one. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. I think it's a great verse to bring to you. I wonder if you ever find it difficult to know what to pray for, for people. Some people you know very well. And because you know them, you perhaps know what they're going through. You know where they are at any particular time. And so you will be able to pray for them. It may be that you've spoken to them and they might have said to you, can you please pray for me in this situation? And you might say to someone, well, I'm, I'm praying for you. I was very challenged a while ago in hearing something that happened in another church. <clears throat> a friend of mine uh, was uh, at the door, as, as you are, and shaking hands, saying goodbye to people. And then a lady came to the door and he shook her hands and he said, I'm praying for you. <clears throat> she said something quite unexpected. She said, what are you praying for? Now that's a challenge, isn't it? What are you praying for? And it made him think. So he said to her, well, what would you like me to pray for? And sometimes it's good for us, isn't it, to say to people, well, what would you like me to pray for? What are the things that are on your heart? What are the things that are happening in your life at the moment? What shall I pray for? And when we pray for people and we think of them, what are the things that are most important? If we don't know what's happening in their lives, if we don't know what their particular needs are, or if they haven't asked us to pray for anything particular, then what should we pray? Well, there are some wonderful prayers in the Bible. And what better than to look into the Bible and to find some of these prayers and to pray them for other people. And what we have here in Romans 15, verse 13, is a wonderful prayer. The Apostle Paul seems to inject little prayers throughout his letters. You suddenly stumble upon them and you think, hang on, he's praying. And this is one of those the incidents where he is praying for the Roman Christians. May the God of hope, he says, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him or in believing, joy and peace in believing is, is better. So this is a great verse and one that we could use in order to pray for one another. And I, I would encourage you to use this prayer to pray for one another. What does it tell us? Well, first of all, it tells us that we pray to the God of hope. May the God of hope he begins and i think it's it's even better in in your version because it is a bird idu fin honig gobeith the god who is the source of hope see that doesn't come out does it in the niv the god of hope yes he is the god of hope but he is the god of hope because he is the god who is the source the fountain of all hope. This is the God that we worship. He is called the God of lots of things. So at the end of Romans 15, we find that he's the God of peace. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To know that he is the God of peace. If we looked into Corinthians 1 verse 3, we would discover him as the God of all comfort. So these are descriptions of, of the great God that we worship. The God of peace, the God of all comfort, the God of hope. So in what sense is he the God of hope? One of the things that I like to remind our church in Bethlehem of is the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's a wonderful summary 
of Christian teaching and Christian belief. It's not inspired, of course. It is simply a man-made summary of questions and answers to do with everything to do with the Bible and the Christian faith. And it's very, very helpful. <clears throat> I'm sure there, there must be one in Welsh. I will look for it and try and find it. But this the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question four. What is God? That's a great question. What is God? And here's the answer. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's what God is. Those are the attributes of God. He's infinite. He has no limits. He is eternal. He is not bound by time. He has no beginning and no end. And he's unchangeable. He is always what he always has been, and he always will be what he is. And that is not true of us. We're not infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. We're very changeable. And we certainly are finite beings in our life in this world. And we have a beginning and we have an end. But in God's being, that's what he is. And so wisdom and power and holiness and justice and goodness and truth are all what God is. But you notice that hope is not there. Because when we say that God is a God of hope, it doesn't mean that he is hope. That's not something that God is. It means that hope is something that he gives. And if we think about what God is like, hope really springs from two of those wonderful truths about God, his goodness and his truth. And if you put God's goodness together with God's truth, you will get hope. It's like the product of a God who is eternally good and eternally truthful. Because he is good, he always wants what is good for us. And he will always give us what is good for us. And because he is truth, he will always do what he says he will do. And goodness and truth together produce hope for us. And that hope, of course, is infinite. And it's eternal. And it's unchangeable. So this is the God that we believe in. This is the God in whom we have trusted. This is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As, uh, as, he, as Paul mentioned earlier in the chapter, didn't he? In verse 6, glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our great God. And he is a God of hope. So how do we know that God is a God of hope? Well, the Bible tells us. In fact, in this passage, the Apostle Paul tells us that everything that is written in the past is written to encourage us and to instruct us. Everything that's written is re referring to the whole of the Old Testament, of course, but we include the New Testament as well. God has given us all of the scriptures so that we might have encouragement and comfort and we might keep going and the result of that is hope so the scriptures teach us to have hope in god but what is that hope well again the book of romans is all about the gospel it's about the good news of the lord jesus christ and what the apostle paul is doing right from the beginning of Romans is he's saying now this is our hope our hope is found in the good news of Jesus Christ so in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 we have that key verse that probably we, we all know where Paul says I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew then for the Gentile. Now, this great theme of the gospel, the good news from Jesus Christ, Paul puts it in the context of Jews and Gentiles. It's for everyone. It's for the Jews first, 
Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was born into a Jewish home. Jesus grew up as a Jew. Jesus went to the synagogue. He learned the scriptures. He grew in his understanding of the Old Testament. He was a Jew in his human nature and in his, uh, in his surroundings. That was Jesus. And he came first to his own people. Yes, his own people didn't receive him, but he came to them first. And the good news of Jesus is first of all for the Jew, but it's also for the Gentile. It's also for the whole of the world. And that's really the great theme of Romans. The gospel is for the whole world. Think about who Paul is writing to. He's writing to Rome. He's writing to Christians in Rome. Rome was a huge city. It was the great capital of the Roman Empire at the time. And there was a whole mixing of all sorts of people there in, in Rome. You go to any great city in, in the UK and you will find a huge mix of people. People from every different ethnic background will be there. People with all sorts of different religions, all different ages will be there, races, wealth, education. In Rome, there were slaves as well as free people. There were all sorts of people there in Rome. And they were there in the church as well. It was representative of the whole of the city, just like all the cities around us and some of our towns as well. And what Paul is saying in Romans is, you can see it there, right in this chapter, in verse 7, he says, accept one another. Accept one another, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. That's what he longs for. He longs to see a church there in Rome where all these different people from all these different backgrounds could accept one another because they are accepted by Christ and in Christ. Accept one another, he says. Now, the greatest division was between the Jews and the Gentiles. That was the greatest division in the whole world, Jews and Gentiles. And the message of Romans is, the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. And as Paul comes to the end of his letter here in chapter 15, he comes back to that great theme again. And he's telling us that the scriptures, the scriptures give us hope that the gospel is for everybody. And the gospel is for the whole world, all the nations of the world all of the non-Jewish people of the world, as well as the Jews. And what he does is he, he stretches back into the Old Testament and he picks a few verses from the Old Testament to prove what he is saying. I went to a church once where, um, if it was your birthday, you were able to come out to the front and, uh, and the pastor had this little box. And inside the box, there were these little tiny scrolls of paper and there was a very special pair of tweezers. And, uh, and the person whose birthday it is, oh, very quaint this, wasn't it? Uh, the person whose birthday it was could take the tweezers and select one of these little tiny scrolls and open it up. And on it was a verse from the Bible. And that was their birthday verse. And they would read it out to the church. I thought it was very quaint. It's not something I would ever do. But I imagine Paul sort of doing that as he comes to Romans 15. He's got his Old Testament and he's going there and he's dipping in and he's picking out this verse. Oh, this is a verse for them. And then he goes back and he picks another one. Oh, this is a verse for them. And he's choosing verses that tell you that the gospel is for you. The gospel is for me. The gospel is for Gentiles. The gospel is for all the world. And he's saying it's always been like that. And so he chooses. You look at verses 8 and 9. And he chooses different parts from the Old Testament. So he chooses, first of all, from the history part of the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 22, verse 50. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praise, I will sing hymns to your name. 2 Samuel 22, verse 50. This is David, the king. And he's singing praises to God. And he's saying, I'm going to do that among the Gentiles. I'm a Jew, but I'm going to sing it among the Gentiles so that they also hear 
the good news of God. But then the Apostle Paul dips into another part of the Old Testament. This time he dips into the law and he goes to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. This time it's Moses. And what does Moses say? Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So he's saying that the Gentiles will rejoice with the Jews so that together they might praise God. So it's not just David praising God among the Gentiles now, it is now the Jews, Moses, with the Gentiles rejoicing. And then Paul dips again, and this time he comes up with a psalm. Psalm 117, verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. You see, we're getting closer now. Not only are we among the Gentiles, not only are we now with the Gentiles, but now he calls on the Gentiles to praise God. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praise to him, all you peoples. And then finally, his last dip into the Old Testament, and he goes to the prophets. He goes to Isaiah, and he says, well, Isaiah tells us, in Isaiah 11, verse 10, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. And now that's where he wants to get. The Gentiles will hope in him. So he says, do you see Christians in Rome with all your mixed backgrounds, Jews and Gentiles? Do you see the Old Testament is telling you that you have hope. And you have hope because you have a God of hope. And this God of hope has given you the gospel in Christ. So there's the first thing that he's telling us in this wonderful little prayer. We pray to the God of hope. We pray to the God who is the source of all hope. God is a God of hope and the gospel is the only hope for humanity. There is no other hope, is there, for all of humanity. I bought a, a book for a friend, it was his birthday, and, and I bought a, a book this week, and I didn't know whether to buy it or not. You know how it is, you see a book, you think, I, he'll, he'll love it, he'll really enjoy it, but I don't really know whether I agree with what the book says. But I knew he'd love it, so I bought it. It was a book about the life of David Attenborough. And of course, there's been an awful lot on the television and their books that he's written and so on. And essentially, his message is, there's no hope for this world. That's basically what he's saying. This world is dying. Um, we are killing it. Um, we, climate change is having a devastating effect. There's no hope for the world. We might already be past the time and past the point of no return and, and so on. And from a science point of view, I guess he's probably right, you know. Um, but, of course, he doesn't have that worldview of the Bible. He doesn't have that. And because of that, he doesn't really have hope. We have a wonderful hope. Yes, this world, we know, one day will be destroyed. But our, uh, it won't be destroyed by human beings. It will be destroyed by God. He's the only one who can bring this world to an end. And, of course, we have to look after it. There's no doubt about that. And, of course, changes need to be made. And in all of that, we agree with people like him. But on the other hand, there is hope. And our hope is in a God who made the world and who will one day remake this world. We do have a wonderful hope. So it's the God of hope that we are praying to. And remember, we live in a world where people desperately need this hope and where they will not find it anywhere else. But we do find it in God, the God of hope. Now, let's see what he's praying for, because we pray to the God of hope, but secondly, our God can fill us with all joy and peace and hope. Our God can fill us with joy, peace and hope. These are wonderful and very precious things to ask for. You know, sometimes when we pray for people, we're asking for some pretty mundane things, and that's not a bad thing. You know, we've, we've been praying for one of our young people to be able to get a place in university. 
That's not a bad thing to pray for, is it? Uh, but it's a, it's a particular thing, that. It's one thing in, in this particular young person's life. We're praying. She has got a place in university, and we thank God for that. But we've been praying very much for that. And then there are other people we've been praying for because they're not well. They're suffering. Some of them have got very serious illnesses. And we pray that God will be with them, and if it's possible, that they will be healed. And, of course, it's good to pray for that. And it's good to pray for all of the, what we say, ordinary things of life. And we are encouraged to pray for, for that, to pray for one another. But here are the big things. Joy, peace, hope. We need to pray for those things. We need to pray that God would fill us and our brothers and sisters with joy. Not just joy, but all joy, a fullness of joy. What is joy? But joy is that deep sense of happiness and contentment that wells up in gratitude and praise to God. It's very deep. It's a deep, deeper than superficial happiness. There is a joy that we can know even in the midst of tears and pain and sorrow. The joy that we have as Christians is something that is very deep indeed because it's, it's rooted in God and all that he is, and all his promises, and his unchangeable nature. And that creates in us this sense of true joy and rejoicing. Joy. We need to pray that people will be filled with all joy. That's just got to come out, hasn't it? You know, joyful Christians uh, are wonderful to behold, and the world needs joyful Christians. We're going to be sad at times, of course we are. But we do have a wonderful joy, and we need to pray that we'll be filled with all joy. Peace is another great thing, isn't it? To be filled with all peace as well. What is peace? Well, peace is an inward state of calm serenity, which wells up in peaceful living and peaceful relationships. You see, if you have a sense of peace in your own soul, there'll be a calmness. No matter if you know, the storms are raging outside, you can be above that, floating above it, without being overwhelmed by it, because you have this sense of peace within. And that means that you will seek to live at peace with others, and you'll have peaceful relationships. And we need that peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding, as Paul says to the Philippians that guards our hearts and minds in Christ. So joy is something to pray for for people. And peace is something to pray for for people. And how do we get this joy and peace? Well, it's faith, isn't it? Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. It is as we believe. It is as we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as we are rooted in him. And he is our focus. That's when the joy and the peace will follow. And not only will this joy and peace fill our lives as we believe, but we will then overflow in hope because the result of it all from the God of hope is that we will have hope and it will be a hope that overflows in our lives. God is not only the God who gives hope, he is also the object of our hope, isn't he? He is the one in whom we hope. Eleven times uh, hope is mentioned in Romans, but especially in certain chapters. Chapter 5, he mentions hope. Romans 5, verse 2. Through him, that's Jesus Christ, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Again, verse 4, uh, that uh, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, when Paul speaks about hope, it's not in the sense of a wish, a possibility. It's not a vain hope. It's not something that we think might happen, but really we don't think it will, but we're holding on to it. No, Christian hope is something solid and true, something that is certain. 
the book of Hebrews describes our hope like an anchor for the soul. The anchor keeps you firm. It is something that is true and it always will come true. We need to fix our eyes on God and on the gospel of hope and not on the immediate situation at times. But our God, you see, can fill us with all joy and all peace and all hope. And that's what we need to pray for, for ourselves and for one another. Those are the big things. And then, in a sense, those other things of life will fit within that. If a Christian is joyful, then it will help them in their daily work, in their studies, in their relationships. It will help them in the difficulties and the sufferings of life. If a Christian is filled with peace, it will help them to go through the struggles and the difficulties that we face day by day, because deep down there will be the peace of God guarding their heart and guarding their mind so that they are not uh, troubled by all the things around them, but they know the peace of God. And if they have hope, they know that the present situation is not the end. There's something better. The best is yet to be, as John Wesley often used to say to his people, the best is yet to be. So uh, we have a God of hope that we pray to, and this great God can fill us with all joy and peace and, and hope. And how does he do it? Well, finally, thirdly, our God works powerfully by his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul finishes the verse by saying, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, C.H. Spurgeon, the great preacher in the uh, 1800s in London, uh, he used to climb the steps to his pulpit and on every step he used to say to himself, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Another step. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Another step. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many steps he had. For every step, he said, I believe in the Holy Spirit, because it's essential that we as Christians believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in a great God, the Father. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only son. But we also believe in the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, then we could receive nothing from God. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that God works. And we need to believe that God does work today in his people by the power of the Holy Spirit. As you pray for people, you see, this is a remarkable thing, isn't it? And quite, it's quite remarkable. It's mysterious. We were praying for something two Tuesdays ago in, in the church. Um, and it was a very practical issue. Someone needed to find a flat to live in. And it was a very practical thing. And there we are, a group of elderly people, most of us. And uh, we we're on Zoom and we we're all praying together, we were praying for this person to get a, get a flat. And at the same time that we were praying, someone telephoned this young lady and said, would you like a flat? I've got actually a three-bedroom house. Would you like to rent that? And she's doing Christian work up in Glasgow. And you think, well, how does that happen? It's not because we're very good at praying. It's not because we're particularly spiritual. It's because God is at work. And we need to believe that God, by his Holy Spirit, is at work when we pray. And so that when we pray for other people, he can fill that brother or sister with joy and peace so that they can overflow in hope to a needy world. That is the God that we believe in. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for you, and I invite you to make it your prayer for others and to believe that the Holy Spirit is able, that God is able to do far more abundantly above all that we think or imagine. Amen.